Welcome everyone. This is The Watchers, Lost Secrets of Ascension, Resurrection, and Perfection, based on my book of the same title. Our first chapter is the Angels of Sion. If one could transform their body into a ray of light and could beam to the farthest reaches of heaven, as ancient ascension teachings affirm one can and one day will do, one would pass through the veil or boundary of the first physical heaven and eventually join fellow travelers in the seventh and otherworldly spiritual heaven. There is the, is the city the Bible calls the heavenly Jerusalem or Sion, sometimes pronounced Sion, a place on the border of literary myth and actual eternity, and it's the location of the throne of God of Judaism and Christianity. In Kabbalah, the more esoteric reference to Sion refers to it as the spiritual center out of which reality emerges. One of the more astounding references to Sion and its inhabitants is found in the New Testament's book of Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Sion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. This is an extraordinary statement in the Bible that often is not spoken of. And in Christian art, we see this remarkable statement illustrated for us, the heavenly Jerusalem with all its inhabitants focused or gathered around the throne of God. And in the detail here, we see Jesus and the heavenly Father seated side by side on the throne with a backdrop of a rainbow ring or concentric rings that symbolize the throne of God or the heavenly Sion. When we see the resurrected Jesus, he's often portrayed in Sion, and we know this because he's on a 360 degree rainbow ring and also surrounded by the rainbow, again, the symbol of Sion. In Christian art, it's emphasized that we on earth live down here in the realm of chaos, and all the good stuff we want is in the heavenly realms, and it's part of our earthly quest is to perfect ourselves, to transform ourselves in order to go and dwell in this heavenly location. What we find is that throughout the ancient world, there are references to conveyances or methods of conveyance from earth into the heavenly realms, especially a ladder or stairway. Here in William Blake's rendition of Jacob's Ladder, we see the prophet Jacob, the Old Testament patriarch, asleep on a stone. He dreams of a ladder or stairway to heaven with angels ascending and descending on either side. These angels are the angels of the Lord or the watchers as they are also known, beings who are sent from the heavenly throne to earth to assist us on our own path of ascension and transformation into angels. Something William Blake has done here is most interesting. He shows the path of this stairway going right through the sun. He's picking up on the ancient Egyptian belief that our sun was in fact a sun tunnel, a star tunnel, or a star gate that leads into the heavenly realms. Upon arrival at Sion, we're told, according to ancient temple liturgies, as found in the Psalms, travelers seeking access to God's throne are questioned to determine if they are able to enter the city of God. Who shall ascend to the mountain of the Lord, the Psalm would ask. Who shall stand in the holy place? The answer is clear and unequivocal those who have clean hands and pure hearts. The idea is that we must perfect ourselves, transform ourselves into beings of pure light and pure love in order to ascend this stairway and enter this magnificent heavenly realm. So in Christian art, we will see this process presented to us where we will often see the elect or the chosen ones, the those on the path of perfection, wearing their white robes and being guided through a gateway or a passageway into the heavenly realms. They're being guided by the angels of the Lord or the watchers who are escorting them through the gate to the throne of Christ. And here is Jesus sitting enthroned on his arcing throne with the rainbow ring behind him, which corresponds with the idea once again of the stargate or the portal.
Sion was thought to lie at the center of the world and on top of Yahweh's holy mountain, which is also called Sion, whose base was rooted in the depths of the underworld and whose heights reached into the farthest heavens. This is prompting us to use our imagination to go out as far as we can or as far in as we can into space time or into the mind to find the location of God's throne. Is this location actually the center of the universe located in some unimaginably distant place around which all the galaxies resolved or revolve? That's a possibility. Others, including myself, might locate it in the center of our own Milky Way. We can localize it in this way. Many ancient traditions speak of the Milky Way or the center of the Milky Way as the location of this throne and the place out of which our souls emerged. Black hole physicists tell us today that the center of our galaxy could in fact be a wormhole that leads to other galaxies. So it's possible that we're talking about Scion as an interconnected network of all these passageways or portals that ultimately link to some unimaginably distant location in space-time where we find Scion, the location of God's throne. Something important for us to acknowledge is that Scion is equated with Eden and is considered the name of the promised land. So Sion and Eden and the Promised Land are all the same location. This takes us back to Judeo-Christian belief that we originated in this place of pure light and pure love. We're escorted out of Eden, at which time Yahweh, the Old Testament God, makes a gate at the east of Eden with a flashing flaming sword in the center and at the same time gives humanity coats of skin. And our objective is to learn how to dissolve these coats of skin and return into our original primordial state as beings of pure light and pure love and return to Sion, whether the center of the galaxy or some other place in the universe. The idea here is that we originally were light beings. And in this wonderful painting from the Church of St. Francis of Assisi in, in Assisi, Italy, we see the creation of the souls of Adam and Eve as light beings. Adam is shown as a light being in this almond-shaped portal or gateway called a mandorla. So when we look to the watchers of Sion, we're talking about beings who are here to escort us or return us to our original home, Sion, Eden, the promised land. Foremost among the angels dwelling in this eternal celestial city are the mysterious watchers, also known as the angels of the Lord. They're referred to in the Old Testament book of Daniel as high as a high and illustrious order of holy ones that sit on the supreme judgment council of the heavenly court in Sion, but who come down out of heaven. And as we continue in this presentation, we're going to see exactly how the ancients believed the watchers came out or down out of heaven. The watchers are the mighty seraphim the winged and fiery serpents, the burning ones whose swirling bodies are composed of pure love and pure light, according to Judeo-Christian tradition, and are full of eyes, an appropriate attribute of those who watch or, gods, or guard God's throne, which is their role. In Christian art, the seraphim are portrayed with swirling vortex-like bodies covered with feathers and six wings. So when we look at extraordinary depictions such as this, we know that we're talking about energetic beings, beings of pure light, pure love, whose bodies are swirling vortexes of light and love. And of course, they're covered with many eyes, indicating they're ultimately wise beings or omniscient in a way. They have attained cosmic consciousness. So throughout time, the seraphim have been the angels to which we most aspire to connect with and also, in fact, to become. During the Renaissance, there was a belief developed that the seraphim were actually transformed humans, humans who have transformed themselves into beings of pure light and pure love and now dwell at God's throne in Sion. But they phase back and forth between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. They come down out of heaven. And they are so super intelligent, so super mysterious, that they're just on the edge of human imagination. They appear to be able to be anywhere in the universe they choose in a matter of seconds as if they travel at the speed of thought. 
in the Jewish mystical book, the Zohar, uh, we learned that their walking is like the appearance of a lightning bolt. That's plasma, according to science. A vision of them is like a vision of a rainbow. Their faces are like a vision of a bride, and their wings are like the radiance of the clouds of glory. So they're lightning-like, they're rainbow-like, and they are radiant beings. These are key physical attributes or descriptions that are going to become very important to us as we continue our presentation. But just for the moment, let's think of them as plasma-like beings, these swirling masses of plasma, lightning-like uh, energy and light, as well as beings of pure love that can phase back and forth between the material and the immaterial realm.